I'm so excited to be kicking off this React conference. Uh, and who better to kick off a React conference than me, a core member of the Angular team. Um, thank you for not booing. I really appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, my name is Emma Tversky, and I'm a senior developer relations engineer on the core Angular team at Google. Um, thank you so far for being so welcoming. Hopefully you still feel that way in about 20 minutes. Um, and obviously, I'm here to talk about my favorite framework, all of them. Um, the thing that no social media troll is ever going to tell you is that under the hood, the mechanisms of every framework on the web are surprisingly similar. And in fact, Angular and React are extremely similar. At their core, they're both frameworks that are model-driven UIs. In both frameworks, we use plain values, no special wrappers or proxies. And when I change a value, there's some trigger that each framework uses to know when to run synchronization. Both frameworks use dirty checking or a diffing operation to determine what changed and which part of the UI needs updating. In Angular, we diff the data directly. In React, you diff the virtual DOM. And in both Angular and React, that synchronization operation works against sub-subtree of components. In fact, there's not a ton of people in this world writing frameworks that are used by millions of developers every day. So to let you in on a secret, framework authors talk. And in fact, we're friends. And our frameworks are two of a much larger family of dirty checking frameworks. We've evolved independently and together based on the changing needs of the web ecosystem. So today, I want to start by challenging your understanding of how our frameworks have collectively contributed to the web. And it may seem at first like most problems are solved by like a single invention, right? Like a single aha eureka moment. But for any major innovation, that's not the case. Take components, for example. We all write them and we all use them. But did one framework just suddenly invent them? No. It may seem linear, like a single idea was the start. But instead, it was really many steps forward, and they continue to evolve today. In 2010, AngularJS, the predecessor of current day Angular, was the first framework on the web to put declarative model-driven UIs on the map. In AngularJS, template and UI logic was separate. It wasn't until React followed a few years later, drawing from AngularJS's approach, that the idea of components were introduced. React introduced a way to abstract the template and its UI logic into something called a class with a render function. Modern day Angular launched three years later, inspired by React's component classes, and we introduced the concept of the component declared with decorators. And React continues to evolve, right? Like that previous slide isn't how you write your components today. Now you've migrated to functional components. And this idea keeps evolving on the web. These days, most frameworks on the web use some concept of the component, drawing inspiration from one another and cross-pollinating ideas across the ecosystem. New frameworks have launched and are inspired by the component models of both of our frameworks as well as others. And we've collectively learned from one another over time. We haven't landed on one single solution, but we're all iterating collectively together on the research and work done before us. So this innovation is a system, a series of interconnected frequencies, not a single light bulb turning on aha moment. And even the light bulb was invented simultaneously by 21 different people in different parts of the world. Edison may have gotten the final pat patent across the line, but the innovation of the light bulb was slow, cumul uh, cumulative, and inevitable. And together, 
our family of frameworks have brought that innovation to the web ecosystem together. And that family tree isn't actually so linear. Remember how I said it was more like a network or a system? Angular and others have stood the test of time, but none of them were created or like thought of out of thin air. The first iteration of Angular, AngularJS, was one of the first modern JS frameworks and drew inspiration from its predecessors, Rails and jQuery, neither of which we'd really categorize as modern JS frameworks as we know them today. From there, we have Ember, which was also in this first wave, drawing inspiration from Rails as well as Handlebars, which Yehuda Katz had previously worked on, and AngularJS's single page app capabilities. Then we have Backbone, which learned from Angular, but also Rails's MVC approach, and Knockout learned from Handlebars and jQuery, introducing the important concepts such as computed properties. In the second wave, we have React, which drew from AngularJS, but dropped the M and C out of MVC and really focused on that view layer. It was also inspired by Backbone and Redux, was heavily er, Redux, which was heavily adopted at times for state management, drew inspiration from Elm. Modern Angular obviously drew inspiration from AngularJS, but also learned a lot from React. Vue took inspiration from many sources, AngularJS for template authoring and binding, React for the view-only approach, Knockout for computed properties, Elm and Redux for Vuex state management. And Svelte simplified much of what came before it, drawing from many modern framework concepts, but leaning more heavily into the compiler. So we're all part of this shared same history, and we're all trying to innovate and solve the same problems. And React and Angular are starting to get wise with age, right? For Angular, we have over 10 years of developer insight and feedback. And we've seen millions of developers find success and build amazing things. But we also see where cracks start to form. And one of the things that's starting to worry us is that developers struggle to maintain performant applications. As your application gets bigger and bigger, the number of those components grow, your model uh, complexity increases, and that dirty checking takes longer. It just does. And both Angular and React give developers options for managing the increased workload. In fact, we both support the same major two techniques, tree pruning and memoization. Tree pruning is an optimization technique for dirty checking where some components can be skipped if it's known that nothing's changed in them. React supported tree pruning for class-based components with should component update which allowed a component to decide when it needs to be re-rendered. In Angular, onPush provides a very similar mechanism, avoiding dirty checking of a component when it's not required. Skipping components that don't need to update is a good start, but what about when a component does need to update? Memoization is another technique that can optimize expensive computation, such as array filtering, by caching their results and avoiding recomputation unless their specific dependencies change. In React, you're very, sim or you're very familiar with the term memoization. Uh, the use memo hook does exactly this. It uses dirty checking to memoize expensive computations. In Angular, we have the concept of pure pipes, which do much of the same thing with a different API, but very similar with semantics. But peer pipes in Angular have some problems that we recognize. They're tricky to write, uh, they only work in templates, and we've considered should we add something like use memo to Angular, right? We're looking at that cross-pollination of ideas. And doing so might make sense, right? We're both part of this dirty checking family, but use memo isn't without its own problems. Developers still need to opt into using it, and you need to maintain the cache key as your application changes. So we feel like we've reached a fork in the road. 
Um, we could keep going down this road of optimizing the dirty checking operation that we're currently doing, and that's worked great over time. But what we'd really love to do as a framework is integrate performance consideration by default and find ways for developers to build applications without having to manually optimize them, right? Uh, this idea has sort of evolved of like performance by default instead of by opt-in. And we've seen that some Angular applications achieve this uh, and keep performance under control even as they scale. But rather than lean into dirty checking, these applications use a different technique change notification. So these applications use RxJS observables to deliver fine-grained, targeted information about when the model changes and which specific components are affected by change. Doing this isn't without cost. Uh, it requires keeping track of state using observables instead of plain values. But for that price, they avoid the need to keep tuning performance as their application grows. They're performant by default and at scale. So we at the Angular team looked at the family of frameworks already solving for this and drew inspiration. And we feel that rethinking reactivity is a natural next step for our frameworks. We also have some things that are uniquely going for us in this situation, right? A majority of the Angular community is already reaching for these patterns using existing tools like OnPush and RxJS. Angular components don't rerun, making it easier to integrate a different approach to updating the UI. And we already separate static and dynamic parts of our templates in our compiler. So we feel we're uniquely positioned to be ready for this. And we're trying something different, right? We're evolving and trying to take a next step forward in this research and evolution on the web. And Angular version 16 launched this spring, introducing a new reactivity model based on signals. Angular signals is a system that granularly tracks how and where your state is used throughout your application, allowing the framework to optimize rendering updates for you. A signal is a wrapper around a value that can notify interested consumers when that value changes. So signals contain, can contain any value from simple primitives to complex data structures. And a signal's value is always read through a getter function, which allows Angular to track where the signal is used and computations automatically track their dependencies, eliminating the need for maintenance of the memoization key. And sure, Angular was well positioned for this, but Preact shows that React is also pretty well positioned to explore this. And we see a lot of early opportunity for a more fine-grained reactive network. And Angular is not alone in this research, right? We're actually looking at an entirely new family tree. So we're still sinking the DOM with dirty checking. We're not leaving that family behind but we no longer need use memo with computed, and we're no longer needing to prune the component subtrees. So instead, we're reaching for fine-grained reactivity to address how we scale the dirty checking model in a performant by default way. And we have the ability to join some other great frameworks that are already doing this. Solid, Vue, Ember, Knockout, some of these frameworks are really old too. They've just taken a different approach and learned and had different problems along the way, right? Gail, the dirty and we want to draw on that research and continue to evolve the web platform in the direction that we think is best for developers. And we're a family of frameworks, so the Angular team feels like we can all learn from each other. Angular has learned from React, from its component models, and we think React can learn from our explorations as well. So keep an eye out on the Angular space, and if these are problems that you've faced as a developer, feel free to check us out. Um, and thank you, and find me in the hallway. I'd love to chat. <laughs>